to step out of that paradigm may be health and life to you. But are you willing to let go of everything that means? You might have to be rejected by people you think are your friends. You might have to go from, you know, chasing some form of fame or some form of acceptance to really go, you know, I'd rather live than pretend I'm living and feel like I'm dying on the inside. Well, hello everybody. It's been a long time since I've done one of these, but I'm excited to be back to talk about autoimmune issues. And I wanna hit this from a different angle and also explain to you part of the insights we've had over the years. Uh, we have a keen interest in what the medical community says, but we are not medical science. And at some point and at some juncture, we really can't substantiate the mechanisms of how healing happens and why people have creative miracles apart from insights that we believe that God has given us in application. So the first place that is, I, I know there's a lot of places where people would argue with Dr. Henry or Pastor Henry Wright about things, but the one thing that I saw on a routine basis was the amount of healings and creative miracles that would take place as people apply their hearts to repenting around certain issues he pointed out. And he pointed them out, not just from the standpoint of an observation, but from what the Bible says. So the central point of my conversation will be the Bible. And what is most interesting to me about the subject of autoimmune issues in this conversation is the fact that when I looked at the definitions online of autoimmune, I want to make sure that, that nothing has changed recently. But one of the most fascinating things is about the fact that the immune system is essentially attacking healthy tissue of the body, not a foreign invader. So how did we get to the possible spiritual roots about self-hatred and all these terms that we use? Well, it's, what, what has struck us about this is that a person is opposed to themselves. The, the person views themselves as the problem and that's why their body re reacts to the way they think about themselves. So they're attacking themselves internally, but then on the outside, it, re it results in their body attacking itself. So the question though becomes, so what are we gonna do about that? Well, I'll, I'll give you kind of a surprising starting point in this conversation. I, I suspect that autoimmune issues are going to only increase rapidly because of the presence of social media. Why do I say that? Well, because I believe that there's, there are so many people who are trying to curate their image to other people. They wanna look a certain way, they wanna have a certain presence, they wanna be what other people want them to be, even if they don't believe that that's who they are at all. When you have to keep up a facade of a pretend person so that other people like that, you end up with, with two terrible conclusions. Number one, you find yourself living under extreme amounts of pressure because you have to keep it up. Have you ever thought that if, you have, if you're forced to keep up an image that is not really who you are, that you're putting unnecessary pressure on yourself and you're treating yourself unpleasantly? You're not giving yourself a break. So I think that the difficulty is that in, in this time, time period, I don't know if people really understand that abuse, whether it's external or internal, comes down to something very basic, is how, how do we really treat ourselves? What, are, what is our real standard of value for ourselves? Where do we go? If, if you put a lot of pressure on yourself and you demand perfection out of yourself, have you ever thought that that's evidence that you don't like yourself? Now, why do I say that? Well, because here's, here's an insight I had about self-hatred years ago for my own life. There were certain patterns that I was living through that I would listen to voices and thoughts. When I say voices, I don't mean I was hearing audible voices, but I would have thoughts, and that's what I'm referring to when I say voices. I'm not referring to hearing anybody 
in my head, but it was, I would have thoughts about certain things in my life. And I believed it was true. And, and, and I, I would follow those thoughts. You know, when I would get, when I would mess up, I would feel so ashamed and guilty that I messed up and people were looking at me and they thought bad things about me that I would just proceed to rehearse and relive failure in my mind to try to figure out, maybe I could figure out how to not do that. Maybe I could figure out how to perform better so that I wouldn't get in that situation again that embarrassed me so badly. But the truth of the matter is, it never ends. If you allow yourself to live in that paradigm where you're always trying to judge your own self and try to figure out how to avoid bad situations where you're going to be undermined or, or ashamed or embarrassed or, you know, made to be made to feel like you failed. Well, that is a never ending cycle that will never end. But then there's another fear on the other side of that. What if people really saw who I really was and they didn't like that? I mean, if there's one thing that I think scares people more than not having an identity, it's the fact that if that identity that I really have is not up to par or up to snuff with what other people want it to be. So what are we going to do about that? Well, I don't know. I, I suppose we can keep going down the same path, but I suspect that people are just going to start to stuff this, pretend until they can't pretend anymore and they just fall apart. But loving ourselves, as people want to, want to describe this, is more fundamentally about getting out of the routine, getting out of the place of trying to figure out who you are based upon whether other people like you or not. And that's a fearful place for many people because their whole value system is based upon do other people like me? Do other people want to be around me? Am I popular? Their value system is purely based upon what the external world tells them they are, tells them they aren't. They don't even bother with the question of, are these, are, do these people even care about me? Is there really any quality to the, these people who say they're, they're my friends? If something went bad in my life, would they really be there for me? I don't think there's, these are the thoughts that go through people's minds. They're just simply looking at the metrics of what makes me acceptable, what makes me okay with other people that I believe means something. But what is really troubling about all this, if we're talking about autoimmune conditions and the idea of if a person's body is attacking itself, then we attack ourselves. Is the, one of the things that comes to my heart around this subject is the subject of guilt. People feel guilty. They feel like they can't live down their past. They can't live down certain things that they've done, said, or maybe who they've been. Well, what do we do with all that? Well, I know that the Bible has brought me peace in this dimension because it's, it's taught me that my standard isn't me. That's really where the Bible has been helpful to me, is it, it released me from having to worry about what the standards of other people were for my life and start to plug into, well, okay, so I just need to be in right relationship with God first. And as I let that be the standard of my value of myself, the standard of my identity system for myself, that place is a place of peace, but it's also a place of simplicity. Now, I'm not saying that it's easy. I recognize that what you're giving up in that moment when you make that decision that my value system is found in the Bible, is you give up all the other value systems that you've been hanging on to. But maybe those value systems are exactly what's killing us. We want to be exactly who a parent wants us to be. We want to be exactly what some social media platform wants us to be. You want, we want to be what certain people that we think are our friends want us to be. We want to be all these things. And if we finally say, you know what, I'm just going to give that up. Maybe we're afraid that if we do that, well, it's too high, high a price to pay. In the story of the rich young ruler and Jesus, he, he was said, well, Jesus said, well, why don't you sell everything you got? Follow me. The young man couldn't do that. 
Now, I, I, maybe it was because of all his att attachment to his possessions and the comfort they brought, or it could also be, been everything else that comes with that. Maybe he had a reputation to uphold. Maybe he had ideas that, that he really cared about and people that were looking to him to be a certain person, and he just couldn't see a way of not being that person that other people wanted him to be. I know that's fearful to a lot of people, but especially if we're trying to, to really address self-hatred and, and self-rejection where we don't really like ourselves. We can't be okay with who we are, warts and all. The only way that I can see scripturally you can actually do that is by looking outside yourself and building your value system not on you, but building your value system on who God says you are. I'm not saying that's easy, but I'm saying it's worthwhile. And I think it's very important to understand where did all this begin? One of the reasons why I really appreciated Dr. Henry Wright over the years that I've been part of this church and ministry was not that he was philosophically the most profound man I'd ever heard, but he cared about application and he saw fruit from that application. Where he began was actually helping people who had severe allergies, people who were dying. And he took a very, very different route than most people of, of his time were. In fact, many of these people who had multiple chemical sensitivity and environmental illness where they were allergic to everything. I mean, these people were literally down to one or two foods. They had to avoid lots of technology, they had to avoid a lot of different environments because of, of fear that their body would react. Many of these people were involved in self-help groups or, or uh, well, not, not self-help groups, but those uh, support groups, that's what, what I meant to say. But they had these support groups where they would get around and talk to other people who were having the same problems, but it wasn't producing fruit in their life. They had many people who were probably coddling them and trying to help them and make sure that the world around them was perfect and fine, but at the same time, they were still dying. So what did this man do? Well, he brought his Bible. He started to teach. He started to minister to some of these people. He dealt with evil spirits in their life. They, they had to repent around certain issues, but he also had to confront them. And what, what his journey taught me is that confrontation especially if something is wrong in your life, if you're swallowing poison on a regular basis, the most loving thing to do just with somebody is to tell them that that's not good for them. Now, why do I say that? Well, because it produced fruit, it produced good fruit in these people's lives. To, for them to be able to see that when they came and they worked with him and he started to minister to them and work, you know, and they started to gain their life back, what, one of the things he had to do is really confront the fact that Th that Satan's kingdom had trained them to believe certain things. That included the fact that some of them were highly sensitive to things like, you know, smoke. And he would bring them to a barbecue place that had a sm open pit, a smoke pit uh, or, or a smoker that would have, you know, smoke coming out of it. And these people would react and he would say, that's, this is not you. You have to trust God in this moment. And they learned to do that. They did not die. In other situations, he would mention about, he, he, would, he would talk about the Orkin man coming, and these people were def, deathly afraid of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of going into shock and their body reacting to any insecticide. And he would just simply say it once in a while, and, the, and they would react. There was no Orkin man coming. They were reacting to the fact that that they had all these memories and thoughts and things that they were agreeing with that would manifest in that moment. And he started, he, that was his way of showing them and revealing to them, you've been lied to, you've been duped. And as they st started to realize that they had to start to hold those, those thoughts captive, they could not just run with it and go, oh no, I'm going to die. Oh no, this and that thing is going to hurt me. As they learn how to trust God instead of trusting their feelings and what was going on inside of them, they started to be healed. These people who were about to die didn't die. Many of them are alive today, years and years later, after he ministered to them. So there's an element of love where we have to confront people. And part of what I'm going to confront you today about, especially around autoimmune issues and, and the world that I see that is becoming increasingly judgmental, increasingly um, callous, 
to real humans, but really trying to form us into an image. And judgment is everywhere. People are just looking literally at images to figure out whether they like you or not, or whether you're worthwhile or not, or whether you have value or not. To step out of that paradigm may be health and life to you. But are you willing to let go of everything that means? You might have to be rejected by people you think are your friends. You might have to go from, you know, chasing some form of fame or some form of acceptance to really go, you know, I'd rather live than pretend I'm living and feel like I'm dying on the inside. That's not easy. But that's part of the challenge I have for you today. And I want to provide scripture so it's not just me talking. But I've said all these things so to prepare your heart to hear scripture because I want to read from 1 John chapter 3. And there's a profound scripture in the midst of this that I might have even read it before when I've done, done videos. But I want to read it again because I, I believe it's so important to overcoming autoimmune issues. So I'm reading from... Um, 1 John chapter 3, and I want to read from verse 18. I want to begin in verse 18. What does it say? It says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. This is application. Deed is not that we do the right works. It's application. Are you willing to live it? And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. That would be God. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So maybe you feel condemned. Maybe you feel like nobody likes you, the world is going to end, and, and you hate who you are. You look at yourself in the mirror and just say, I just, I don't like this person. Well, here's part of the question for you. How much of who you don't like is really even you? Maybe a lot of what you think is you is because you're living in a world trying to cope with being everything that people want you to be rather than starting to submit your heart to God and say, Father, I need help so I can become who you want me to be. And maybe the most liberating place you can go is to stop caring about what people think about you and start to say, Father, will you show me who I really am? And, and let that discovery happen. And maybe you'll lose a lot of your friends. Maybe you'll lose a lot of people that you think are so important to you. But at the end of the day, you'll pause and go, but I'm happy with who I am. I like this life a lot better. Maybe there's liberty in not being so constrained to figuring out what everybody thinks about you and instead starting to go, Father, you still love me, right? All right, that's good enough for me. Now, why am I saying that? Because... I would say the, the, the biggest question, as, as I've been saying lately, the billion dollar question is, okay, so how do I get out of feeling condemned? If I'm still learning how to trust God even when I feel condemned, like, oh, I'm such an awful person, I'm trusting God. Well, what, is, what, what does that mean? Well, verse 21 is really part of this answer. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, okay, I'm going to pause. What, what, do you, what, what would you fill in the blank for if, if our heart doesn't condemn us? Is it, is it self-affirmation? I mean, I suppose you can say that you love yourself, but what, what self are you loving? What self are you accepting? Is it your shell? Is it your body? Is it the way that you are around your friends? What thing are we liking about ourselves that we are affirming with our words? Maybe that's not the answer at all. So what does the scripture really say? It doesn't talk about self-affirmation if we don't feel condemned. Verse 20, 21 says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. See, a human being can never know who they really are if they don't know who, who made them. Our, the true value of who you are is connected to who He is. Now that, that may not sound real simple and pleasant for a lot of people because they, they want to feel like they're in control. Well, that's part of the change. Are you willing to have fun and not be in control? I know that that fun and not in control is probably not words that people like to hear. 
But maybe part of the reason why we're so hard on ourselves is because we've dev devised a standard, and Satan's kingdom has helped us to devise a standard of who we believe we're supposed to be, that we can control, we can determine, but it's burning us out, it's wearing us out, and it's making us feel exhausted. And we feel guilty because we can never measure up to this standard that we've allowed to be built for us. But maybe it's because it's entirely wrong anyway. Maybe our, our confidence needs to be towards God instead of ourselves. Verse 22, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Now, this is where people get themselves in trouble in Christianity, is that they read this scripture out of context. They think the word commandments, and they think the law of Moses. So are you putting me back under the law of Moses? No, I'm not. In fact, the next scripture is about to define to you what we're really talking about. So no, it's not about works of the law of Moses. So what, what does God want from us? It's pretty simple. It's it, we're found in verse 23. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave his commandment. See, but there's a priority here. The prioritizing is believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ and then love one another. See, in order for us to really be okay with one another, it's that we have to stop finding our value in other people. Can you really care about other people and not be caring about them because they can do something for you or because you need to perform so they don't reject you? I think that's a hard thing in these days, but that's where love can really flow, not from you, but from God, when you stop worrying about whether people like you or not and start saying, I love because I've been loved first. By whom? By God. All right, what, what does it say in, in, in John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is the one who first gave us the gift that we didn't deserve. So he's already reached out to you in love toward you. The question is, are you going to believe that he really did, does love you and trust him because his Bible, the Bible says so? I'm going to leave you with this. Verse 24, And he that keeps his commandment dwells in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abides in us by the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, which he has given us. See, this is a challenge for all of us, because maybe you're wondering right now, but if I follow God and I really let go of the value system of what other people think about me and how I'm going to be judged, and even the value system I've developed for myself of what I believe accomplishment looks like and success looks like and all these things, well, what, what am I left with? How am I going to know that I, I'm okay? Well, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. You have been not, not, not been left comfortless. There's peace there for you when you decide that God is your comforter. It's, it's my position that there's an element of Abraham's journey found in Genesis when he followed God and left his people, when he left Ur of the Chaldees and he just said, okay, I'm going to follow God, that we all have to follow as, as believers, as Christians. Maybe you're not even a, a Christian or a believer. Well, at some point, hopefully, you're going to choose this journey. But the point at the, at the end of this is to say that we have to leave it all behind. He left everything behind to follow God. Now, I'm not saying that you have to quit your job, quit being around everybody in your family, and then just literally pick up everything and leave. What I'm saying is at some point, you're going to have to make the decision that my value system, who I am, what I believe, where I'm at, is not found in other humans. That's how you're leaving it behind. And if my friends, my family, everybody on social media and everything doesn't like me and talks bad about me, I'm going to be okay. But why are you going to be okay? Will it feel bad? Oh, it probably will feel bad if people don't like you anymore that used to like you. But at the end of the day, you're making the decision. Say, I'm going to follow God. I'm going to follow you, Father, regardless of what it costs me. Regardless of whether people like me or not, I'm going to say what I believe I need to say, be who I believe I'm supposed to be according to the, my Bible, and not according to the whims of the world around me. With that said, Father, I pray that you would work with everybody, including myself, 
to really understand the depth of what, what I'm talking about today. That we would truly learn how to have our confidence in you, not in ourselves, not in what we can see. And Father, I pray that you would also release those who want to be released from any self-hatred and, and any unloving spirits and guilt that they've carried around because they didn't measure up to expectations, even their own expectations of what they thought they're supposed to be or, or feel like they haven't succeeded the way they, they think they're supposed to succeed. And Father, I pray that you would bring peace to them and a renewed understanding from your word and peace in their heart according to your spirit to start to move forward into a brand new day. With that said, Father, thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. With that said, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, I hope to see you again sometime. Catch you later. Bye.